I'm going to start out with a question for you tonight. How many of you like surprises? Anyone like surprises? A few of you. All right, yeah. Um, you know, one of the best things about Christmas is surprises. Uh, you think about how we celebrate it. We do it with gifts, and, and I love the fact that we get to torture our kids for uh, two weeks or, or a night, depending on when you uh, shop for gifts and all of that, right? But you have those gifts that are sitting under the tree for weeks at a time. And, uh, and, you, uh, and, and the kids are just like, they, they want to know what's in there, and so they shake it, and, they, and they just, it just drives them crazy. And sometimes they ask you to open the gifts early and all of that, and you say, no, no, wait until Christmas, because if you don't, then it's not going to be a surprise, right? How many of you like that aspect? Have you like those surprises? Yeah, me too. I like surprises. My wife does not like surprises. She doesn't like to be surprised. I think it's a, I think it's a control thing, and, uh, but, but we, you know, we'll work through that ourselves. And uh, so, so this year, I thought I would do something nice for her, and uh, so the other day, I went out shopping. I did it with my, with my daughter, and uh, we, have a, uh, we have a Klein Saucer. That's our last name. We have a Klein Saucer, um, I guess, Facebook uh, chat, I guess, that we do. And uh, so that's where we put our Christmas list. And I, I got her what, was on her what was on her list. I thought, ah, she'll, really, she'll really like this. And, uh, but I thought, she also doesn't like surprises. And so I bought the gifts. And I took them home, and I took them out of the bag, and I didn't wrap them, but I put them under the tree. Because I thought, well, this will be, be a good thing. She doesn't have to be surprised. Then she can kind of work her way up to it, and it's, you know, not a big deal. Okay, word of advice for you. All right. <laughs> not a good idea. All right. I, I found out that my, my wife actually likes surprises a little bit more than I thought. All right, so I thought I was being nice. So anyway, um, she, had, she had my daughter Ellie wrap them. So I guess now she feels like she's going to be surprised on, uh, on Christmas Day or she's going to feign surprise maybe when, when she does it, you know. Anyway, she doesn't like surprises so much. I like surprises. And that's the cool thing about Christmas is Christmas is full of surprises. And it's not just about the gifts either. The, Christmas is full of surprises just, well, for instance, in, in how we celebrate Christmas. And, uh, and you might be surprised to know that Christmas hasn't always been celebrated the way we do it. For instance, today, um, it, Christmas is sort of a family event. In fact, many of our congregation is gone because they've traveled to go see family or maybe they're at a family celebration. It's a, a very traditional um, sort of thing. And, and uh, maybe you right now, in order to come to this, had to forego a family celebration, at least for the time being, or come late. Uh, but it's, it's seen as a sort of quiet um, sort of celebration. But it wasn't always that way. In fact, Christmas, especially in the United States and, and in Europe, um, was, was more of a public event, kind of like we did tonight. Um, it was more of a public event and not so much a private family event. And so that's oftentimes surprising for people, that they didn't always celebrate the way we do. And also, did you know that Santa was not always the plump, lovable guy that we know today? Um, in fact, Santa has gone through quite a, uh, quite a number of changes over the years. Uh, of course, he was, is based on St. Nicholas, who was a saint, I think, in the 3rd or 4th century, who is known for being ge very generous, gave away so much. He was a wealthy guy, but he gave away much of what he had to, to the poor. And, uh, and so that's how Santa kind of got based on, on St. Nicholas. But did you know, you might be surprised to know, that Santa did not always just bring gifts Sometimes he brought punishment. And so for the kids who were good, he would bring gifts. For the kids who were bad, oftentimes he would leave a cane under the tree, and, uh, and the parents would mete out punishment there. Now, this is a little different than what we normally think about Santa, right? Um, in fact, I think if we still did that, kids would not get up quite so early in the morning on Christmas morning. So, you know, parents, if you don't want to get up so early, you might want to institute that policy there. Uh, but that was, uh, that was, that was Santa. And, and Santa didn't always look the way he does now. Um, and, and so what I did was I brought some pictures of different portrayals of Santa uh, throughout the years. Of course, it started out with, with St. Nicholas, and so I think we have an icon of him there. Um, he looks like a very holy guy, but not a very fun guy. Um, this is an image of Santa from a Philadelphia newspaper right around uh, 1900. How would you like that guy climbing down your chimney? 
<laughs> and, uh, and suddenly ending up in your living room. Doesn't, doesn't seem like the kind of guy. And this one is even worse. How about this one? I, I call this one nuclear war Santa. And it is a, uh, it's a wonder that those kids are not screaming and running away. I mean, even with Santa today, kids do. But you, can you imagine, you know, going to see Santa and having that um, and having to sit on his lap? Okay. Um, also, from the beginning, apparently, Santa has always wanted to make out with your mom there. That's a, that's a magazine cover from, uh, from 1905. Uh, mom does not seem like she's enjoying that quite so well. Um, so I don't know what that says about Santa. Um, and then finally, right around 1931, he evolved into the Santa that we know today thanks to Coca-Cola. This is the, the roly-poly Santa that, uh, that we have today. So you might have been surprised at, uh, at, at how Santa has evolved over the years. I think I like the, the new Santa probably better than a lot of those other ones at this point, especially the one that does the punishing. So anyway, so maybe you're surprised. Maybe you're surprised about Santa. Uh, but there are other surprising things about how we've celebrated Christmas. Did you know that in colonial times, the Puritans actually made it illegal to celebrate Christmas. Did you think about it? I mean, think about that. Christians outlawing Christmas. Seems like kind of a weird thing for us, doesn't it? Um, it's not just that they refused to listen to Christmas music before Thanksgiving. It's not just that they didn't put their Christmas tree up until uh, Christmas Eve or something like that. They actually made it illegal, and they imposed a five-shilling fine on, uh, on anyone who was caught celebrating Christmas. And it was an additional five shillings if they were caught with cards or dice, right? So anyway... Don't, I don't know how much a shill, shilling is today, but, but anyway, um, it, you know, it's kind of like taking away your birthday. Like, how can you, how can you make it illegal to, to celebrate Christmas? Well, there is a reason why they, like, why they did this. You see, like I said before, Christmas wasn't always a, a private family event. You know, they weren't going into people's homes and, and you know, breaking up Christmas dinner or, or putting a stop to, to gift exchanges or things like that. Um, it was a public event, and it, like I said, kind of like this, except it was much more raucous. And, and there were a lot of things that played into the celebration of Christmas at that time, really three things. The first one was they had a lot of free time. Um, during the winter time, during the winter months especially, in a, in a culture where many people worked in agriculture or worked outside, when it gets cold, then all of a sudden the work starts to dry up. You have a lot of people who are unemployed, and you have a lot of people who have a lot of free time on their hands. So that's one factor. The other one is, is that during that time, since there was no refrigeration, uh, they had to wait until it got cold in order to slaughter a cow, for instance, to be able to have meat. And so once it got cold, this was really the first time during the year that they were able to have large quantities of meat, and they took advantage of it at that time. Now, the third one, maybe even the most important one, was this was also the time when the supply of beer was ready to drink, right? And, uh, and so how about that recipe? Let's cook lots of food, drink lots of beer, and have lots of free time. And what do you have? Well, you have kind of a raucous thing. You have a lot of trouble, especially in the eyes of the Puritans. And so December became known as the voluptuous month. How would you like to, how would you like to call it that, right? It, it was also a time uh, where they, they, they called it the time of misrule, where everything was turned upside down. The, the, high, uh, the, the down and out acted high and mighty. Men Men dressed like women, women dressed like men, and, and young people mocked their elders. And, and maybe one of the most common things and, and the biggest problems with the celebration of Christmas was something that they call mumming. Uh, anybody ever heard of mumming before? Okay, so basically what would happen is you would have bands of young men who would go around from house to house. This was largely happening in Massachusetts at the time where the Puritans were. Um, but they would go from house to house and they would, and they would, they would sing. Right? And, uh, and, and, but what they would do is, is they would demand food and drink from the rich homeowners. Okay? This was the time when this was, was allowed. And so, for instance, um, we, we sometimes sing this song, We Wish You a Merry Christmas, right? You know, you know this song? Let's sing the first verse together. Ready? We wish you a Merry Christmas. We wish you a Merry Christmas. We wish you a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. See, it's a song about good cheer, isn't it? We're wishing 
wishing people a Merry Christmas, right? But you've probably heard other verses, right? Now bring us some figgy pudding, now bring us some figgy pudding, now bring us some figgy pudding, and I don't know how the rest of it goes, bring it right now, right here, right here, right now. Exactly, right? So the, the last verse is, we won't go until we get some, we won't go until we get some, come on, nice and raucous, won't go until we get some, so bring it right here, yeah, I don't know how it goes, you know, <laughs> all right, so the, the song starts to take on a little different meaning, doesn't it, right, we, a lot of times we look at that song and we go, what in the world is that all about, you know, bring me some figgy pudding, of course, we don't really eat figgy pudding, but, but anyway, why would we go house to house and demand this, well, this was part of that practice, but that was only one of the songs that they did it, there were some others here, and, and there are some, um, like, here's, here are the lyrics of one of them, we've come here to claim our right and then, uh, I don't have all of the verses here, but, but basically it ends like this. And if you don't open up your door, we will lay you flat upon the floor. Okay? That's a kind of a catchy, catchy one, isn't it? Um, here's another one. Come, butler, draw us a bowl of the best. And by best, they mean the strongest beer you have. And then we hope your soul in heaven shall rest. But if you draw us a bowl of the small, meaning weak beer, okay, if you give us the bad stuff, um, then down will come butler, bowl and all. <laughs> Isn't that a great song? Great Christmas song, right? All right, so you're starting to maybe see why the Puritans might have outlawed these practices, right? Well, not only was it the time of mumming, but it was also the time when young men and young ladies uh, would participate in other tawdry activities. And, uh, and so this was also a time that was known where uh, uh, it, you can see, you can look in the historical records and you could see that in, in one town in Massachusetts, more than half of the births um, in that, during that time period were seven months after the parents got married. Okay? So do the math there, right? So things were going on, the Puritans really didn't care for it, and, uh, and so that's why they, they outlawed Christmas. So Christmas, it's, it's full of surprises, right? Now, most of us have celebrated Christmas for many, many years. I mean, we've done this for a long time. Many of us have done it the same way uh, just about all of our lives. And, and probably what we do is we read the same Christmas story the same way, and, and uh, we read it over and over again, and it's just a few chapters in the Bible. And so for a lot of us, um, we, we start to think that the story of Christmas is really, really predictable that it doesn't really have many surprises that we delight in so much. But what I want you to see tonight is that when you read it with fresh eyes, what you see is, is that the Christmas story is, itself is filled with one surprise after another. Okay? So for instance, Jesus was a surprise, right? Um, uh, Mary, uh, think about Mary. He's a teenage girl, never been with a man, finds out she's pregnant. I mean, what bigger surprise can you have than that? I mean, and, and, and she finds out from an angel. I mean, can you imagine uh, having an angel show up um, at, your, at your house? I mean, that would be a, a huge surprise, okay? I mean, most people find out they're pregnant from a little stick, you know, a plastic stick with a line or an X or something like that on it, you know? But an angel shows up. I mean, that's a, that's a big surprise, okay? And, and how about Joseph? I mean, he's getting ready to be married to the girl of his dream or maybe getting married to the girl of his parents' dreams. You know, it might have been an arranged marriage. Uh, but anyway, he, he, was, he was willing, and uh, he was getting ready to start a family, and he was surprised to find out that Mary had already started without him. And, uh, and so that would have been really surprising as well. Okay, so, so Jesus himself was a, was a huge surprise. Also, the birth announcement was a surprise. You know, when Jesus was born, uh, there, were, there were two groups that it was announced to. Do you remember who they were? Who were they? Shepherds, okay, we read that one earlier, okay, and? The wise men, shepherds and the wise men. Now, when, when we do our kids' plays, we always think of them as, as respectable, you know, good people because they're, you know, there are kids with towels around their heads and things like that. And so we think they're good people. But actually, if you, if you go back in history, what you'll find is, is that, well, the, the three wise men, first of all, were magi. In other words, they were magicians. They were astrologers. And astrology was something that was strictly forbidden in the Old Testament. And yet, God announced 
announced the birth of Jesus to astrologers, and he did it through astrology. I mean, think about that. That's pretty surprising, right? But he also announced it to shepherds. Now, of course, for, for us, we don't really realize that shepherds during that day didn't have a great reputation either. In fact, they were kind of the, what would you call them, the, the carnival workers of the ancient world. Okay? They were oftentimes people who had a sordid past and, and they were trying to get away from society. Um, they were kind of you know, rough around the edges. And of course, they were always out working with animals. And, and so they smelled. I mean, they, they were at, you know, at best regular Joes, and at worst, they were lowlifes that were being pushed to the margins of society. And yet, isn't it amazing that of all the people that God chose to reveal the birth of his son to, it was these guys. I mean, the king of kings, you know, the one who would change the world forever. You would think that he would want to, uh, that God would want to announce this to the emperor or to King Herod or to, you know, anyone, even just a high priest or someone like that. And yet, for some reason, God chose to send birth announcements to these kinds of people that were, that were on the outside, that were, that were on the margins, okay? People don't typically send birth announcements to random people. We send them to people that we love, the people that we, that we care about, okay? And yet God chose to do something different. Pretty surprising. Well, here's why I bring this up. It's because that there are many of us who have in our minds an image of what God is like. Um, it might be from the way God was presented to us growing up. It might be from the way the, the church has been portrayed or God has been portrayed in the, in the media, popular culture. Um, it might be just an image that we've built up in our minds and we don't really even know where it came from. But when we look again at the God of the Christmas story, you might see some things that are kind of surprising to you. For instance, some of us view God as predictable and uninteresting. Okay? We don't want to you know, go to church. We don't want to really have a whole lot to do with God because there are a lot of things in my life that I, have, I, have, I, I, I can better spend my time doing than you know, messing with a, with a God like that. But in the Christmas story, God is anything but predictable and boring. Now, I'm not going to guarantee you that a choir of angels is ever going to show up um, on your doorstep or when you're out in a field tending to some sheep, okay? Not gonna, I'm not going to tell you that will happen, okay? Um, but listening to God and following where he leads oftentimes will take you on an adventure and take you places that you never thought you would go. And it, and it fills your life with a sense of meaning and purpose that maybe you didn't really realize that you could have. You might be surprised that when you follow this God, that when you pay attention to this God, that something will change in your life and you'll realize how significant your life really is. Okay. Some people, for instance, see God as being vengeful. Um, they maybe view him as, as like, like Sauron, you know, in, in the Lord of the Rings movies, uh, the big eye that's always watching for you to, to mess up, and, and he's doing that so he can punish you. And that's the image that a lot of people have about God. But I want to invite you again to look at, at that God again, at the God of the Christmas story, because you might be surprised to know that it was actually God's love for us that caused him to come and be with us. One of the most famous verses in the Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. And, and why do people give gifts? Well, they give gifts because they want to establish or they want to, or they want to deepen a relationship. And this is the reason why God gave the gift of his son, to establish or to deepen a relationship with us. And so if you look again at the Christmas story, you might find that God is maybe a lot more loving than you gave him credit for. Or there are some people maybe who think that God is distant um, that God doesn't take an interest in our day-to-day -day lives. But man, if you look at the Christmas story, we see a God who came down, well, to get a better look, but even more than that, we see a God who came down to experience what we experienced in life so that there's nothing that can happen to us where, we'll, where God will say, I don't know what that's like. 
He came to, to live among us and to, to be with us, to be involved in the details of our lives. There is nothing that we can do that God doesn't see and he doesn't care. So try him out and you might just be surprised how much God cares about your life. And then there are some people who believe that God only cares about the people who have their stuff together. And that's a pretty popular one these days. You know, people who don't have bad habits or addictions like you do. Or, or maybe the rich and respectable people who are accomplishing something in life. A lot of times we think that's the, that's the God of, of the Bible, the God of Christmas. But you might be surprised to know that Christmas shows us that God knows you and he loves you even if you're ordinary. In fact, even if you are below ordinary, below average, even if you are a saint or a sinner, if you have low self-esteem, disability, a less than stellar past, current habits, addictions. I mean, what else could it mean that God sent a birth message to these shepherds who are on the outside of society other than God is coming or God came to us to draw us, no matter who we are, to himself? And then there are a lot of people who believe that when God shows up, that you will absolutely know because the signs are unmistakable and obvious. Well, the Christmas story shows us that sometimes the busyness and distraction of life, the entertaining ourselves and the not paying attention, that we can actually miss his coming. What it shows us is, is that God is not loud, that God will not force himself upon us, but he comes in the stillness. He won't overwhelm us with shock and awe, but he is a God who is there and a God who makes himself available to us in our time of need. And so I want you to consider, again, that maybe this God that you've had all these images of Maybe, maybe he's just not quite what you thought.
Oh, you came like a winter snow. You were quiet. You were so. So the request or the challenge that I have for you tonight is to not allow tonight to go by without considering again the image of God that you've had. Because Christmas, the Christmas story, challenges all of the things that we're tempted to believe about God. And so I guess what I'd ask you to do is, is tonight, I don't know if you have family celebration or what you've got going on. But take the time to to crack open your Bible and turn to Matthew or to Luke or to both of them (laughs) and read the story again and just allow God to speak to you and to, to push away those images that you have made of him. To allow his love to to wash over you again. We are so good at entertaining ourselves and occupying our minds so that we don't ever have to think about it. And really what this season is about and what this day is about, what tomorrow is about, is a God who came to us to show us who he is, to show us who we are called to be, and ultimately to die and to rise again to show us what our future is like. And so I would challenge you to take the time and do that. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for tonight. We thank you for the fun that we've had. Thank you for the food that we've eaten, for the friends that we've uh, met with, for the new people that we've met. And God, I I just pray that, that tonight would be a time where you would speak to us. God, that we would see you afresh and new, that that maybe there would even be something that would surprise us, that would delight us. And so, Lord, I pray that we would take the time to slow down, to quiet ourselves, and allow you to speak to us again, to surprise us. We thank you again for bringing us together. And pray that we would all have great celebrations with our families and uh, and that your spirit would move among us wherever we go. We pray this in Jesus' name.